Today I'm going to show you what's inside of this Honda J-Series V6 engine and how it works. We're also going to take a look at why Honda engines are so strong, well built and fairly reliable as an insight to why Honda is still using this 25 year old engine design family today. Now we're going to start with this engine, it's a 3.5 liter V6 J35A8 engine out of a third generation Acura TL Type S. And we don't really know the real reason why this engine was scrapped so we're going to start by just tearing things apart to see what's inside. And keeping close guard on that TL Type S engine, we've got a J32 engine out of a stock TL. But taking a look at the engine setup, we have this giant tank on top of the engine here and that's a giant air collector which is going to take air coming in from the throttle body and feed it down the middle of this V. We've got three cylinders over on this side here and three on the back side over here. Now this engine is mounted transversely in all Acura products which means that we have the timing side of the front of the engine here on the passenger side of the vehicle and this is what faces the front of the vehicle. Now further down below integrated into the head is the exhaust manifold and below that we have the engine block and a separate oil pan. Now taking a look at the front part of the engine we have the timing covers here that house a timing belt inside. An engine mount would normally go here as well as your alternator and AC compressor. We have the crank pulley over here the oil filter down here, the VTEC solenoid over here. Now we're going to start at the top here, we're going to remove this plate with all these 10 millimeter bolts. And now I'll just lift off this plate over here. Now also inside of here we have this flap which is controlled by this little motor and that's for the variable induction system to either lengthen or shorten the air runner paths depending on engine RPM. I've got another video on this linked above. Remove a couple of 12 millimeter bolts for the air intake plenum. And with that we can remove this giant bowl here. I also notice that the throttle body is really dirty on the inside there as well as this air intake chamber is pretty dirty so this engine probably was in service just by looking at the top end. So I've loosened up the wiring harness here. I'm just going to go ahead and remove that from the engine so we can have a closer look. So up here we have the air intake plenum gasket and this air intake is an interesting design. It's actually split down the middle here and this half comes off with this head and this half comes off with this head. Now some people are able to get in here with a wrench and loosen it up and kind of jiggle it out but in my experience they kind of clash each other and you can't really get it out without taking the whole head off. It kind of sucks that it have to take off the head to get the intake off especially if you've got to change like a knock sensor or this bypass hose. Well at least the oil coming out of here looks just like oil and it's not mixed with any coolant or water. Next up I'm removing the valve cover. I'll just pry up on the valve cover and pop it off and I'm going to pop off the other side cover here. Taking a look at Honda's valve train design here this is where things get pretty old school where Honda is still using a single overhead cam design so you've got your camshaft up to the front here and it runs down the center and it's shared by the intake and the exhaust side. It has these roller rocker systems here that take the movement of the camshaft in the middle and translate them to the valve stems over here to push the valves in and out. Now there's no automatically adjusting hydraulic tappets here these are manually adjusted as the engine wears down. Check out the valve action as I rotate the engine it's got some compression because it's pretty hard to move. Taking a look at the fuel system, we've got two separate fuel rails, one for each bank. Now this is a port injected engine which means that the injectors hang out over here and mix with the air before it goes into the engine as opposed to a direct injection engine. And I'll just jiggle this fuel rail loose here. And you can see that's what the fuel rail looks like. Taking a look at the cooling system, here we've got the upper and lower radiator hose connections that go into the block. There is a bypass tube that goes over to the other side that feeds from the water pump. Inside of here we have the thermostat housing and then at the back of this junction we have two lines that go to the heater core. Now also interesting on many Honda engines is the EGR system and that's responsible for recirculating exhaust gases coming out of the manifold this way and bringing it back around to the intake to get reburned. This is just a pollution control device to reduce emissions. And there's the EGR valve. Now I've already got a video on how EGR valves work and how to clean them up so make sure you check that out linked above. Now I'm going to take off all the 12 millimeter bolts that hold this thermostat housing on. And remove that piece. You can see it's just one giant unit that links both heads together. Here we've got the integrated EGR system where it takes exhaust gases from the front half of the engine here and puts it to the back half of the intake side here. The sitting in between the V here is a bypass pipe that's going to take fluid from the water pump on that side of the engine and bring it over to the cooling side of the engine. Next up I'm going to start disassembling the front half of the engine including all the timing components. Well, I didn't know this was a reverse threaded. Look at this. Next I'm going to remove all the 10 millimeter bolts holding the timing cover on. Now this front bracket holds the tensioner as well as the AC compressor that would normally sit here. Now I'll remove the timing covers from the top here and that reveals the timing belt. So here we have a look at the timing belt and that's one of the downsides of these engines in modern vehicles is that you gotta do a timing belt service once the vehicle reaches a couple of years old and that's just to keep this rubber fresh otherwise it's gonna crack up like you see here. Now if this belt does fail it could cause your pistons and valves to clash and then you need a new engine. While there's still some tension on the timing belt I'm just gonna loosen off the cam bolts. 
I'm going to move this bracket for the front engine mount here. Over here we have the timing belt tensioner. You can kind of see it inside of here. I'm going to release this tension by removing these two 10 millimeter bolts. And you can see the timing belt actually jump there. We'll just peel that timing belt off. And inside the head we have a 14 millimeter 12 point socket that you have to use to get eight head bolts off. So I just got my breaker bar on there. I'm going to use the cheater pipe and break that bolt free. Now with all the head bolts cracked free, I'm just going to zip them loose with the impact. Now I'm going to remove the engine head. It just sits on these dowels here. And here we have a look at the V of the engine block. You can see in between here we have the knock sensor. And it's quite a job to replace the knock sensor or even this wiring harness which commonly gets pretty brittle just due to heat as you can see here. Also down inside of here you can find like some spare screws and bolts and stuff that have made their way down there over the years after you work on your car. Here we've got the head gasket. You can see it's a multi-layer steel here. And these weren't really a weak point on the J-Series Hondas. It's more of a Subaru thing. Now in order to get this timing cover off, I need to remove this crank pulley. But like most Hondas, this bolt is pretty stuck. So I'm going to start disassembling the bottom end of the engine. So we're going to flip this over and remove the oil pan. Now looking from underneath in the front half of the engine, you can see that there was a major, major oil leak. It really built up over the years. It's pretty dirty. To get the pan off, I'm just going to remove all the 10 millimeter bolts that go around it. And with all the oil pan bolts free, I'm just going to pry this up and lift off the oil pan. Now the good thing with these oil pans is they're actually cast aluminum. They're not stamped steel like some other ones that could rust away or easily crumple if something hits it. Now underneath the oil pan we have this splash plate and that's just going to allow the oil to drain through these holes here as it drips back down into the oil pan. This one's got a plastic pickup tube. Now I'm just going to remove all the 10 millimeter bolts I can see. I'm going to remove that oil pickup tube. This one doesn't look too clogged on the inside there. And here we have the splash shield. Now this is where things are going to get pretty oily so I'm just going to come with my brother's old t-shirt here and wipe down this part of the engine. So here we've got the heart of the engine. We've got the crankshaft over here. Now because this is a V6 configuration, we've got pairs of pistons on this side here with four main bearings in the middle that support it. On this side here we have the flex plate that'll bolt up to the transmission. And on this side here we have the harmonic balancer and the oil pump. And you can see when I rotate this engine here, just how everything moves. And I don't notice any free play or broken parts or anything burnt out on this engine. Now in order to get this crank bolt free, I'm gonna use a long breaker bar. So with the crank pulley and the flex plate nice and loose, I'm next going to turn the engine over to get access to these cap bolts here. These are a 12 millimeter, 12 point socket and we'll break them free. And then once all those are broken free, I'm going to zip them off. And I can remove this rod cap here. This one doesn't look too bad, it is scored up a little bit. And I can push the pistons down with my brother's old toothbrush. And then from down below I can release the pistons. This piston doesn't look too bad. Just a little bit of carbon buildup at the top. Now before I can get the crankshaft out, I gotta remove the oil pump and the timing side of this engine. So we're gonna first start by removing this crank bolt and this crank pulley. Luckily I don't think I need a puller for this. And there's the pulley. Now I'm gonna remove a couple of 10mm bolts to hold the timing cover, as well as this oil filter housing on. On the side here we have the VTEC solenoid that engages the VTEC system which is what makes this engine so legendary. And if you remove the timing cover, I'm going to remove the crank position sensor and it's got its own wiring harness. I'm going to remove this timing gear here. You can see just how oily it is inside of this cover here. Depending on what mood she's in, I'm probably going to return this toothbrush to my wife. Now the VTEC solenoid hangs off of the oil filter housing here and it uses oil pressure to activate different cam profiles. I'll have another video on how VTEC works later. This one used a Fram oil filter, so you can definitely tell this engine has seen some abuse. Now one of the disadvantages of this timing belt system is that the water pump is buried all the way inside of here, which means that you gotta pretty much disassemble the front half of the engine, get the belts off, in order to get this water pump changed. That's why it's a good idea to change your water pump when you are servicing the timing belt. Now I'm gonna remove a couple of 14 millimeter bolts that hold the tensioners and idlers on. Now I'm gonna remove all the 10 millimeter bolts that hold this water pump to the block and I can remove that water pump. Next up I'm going to work on all the 10 millimeter bolts that hold the oil pump to the block. And now I can pry that oil pump off of the block here. So now with the front half of the engine disassembled you can see we've got the main bearing caps here. Now they're held in by two bolts here. Now what's really good is that this one's also held in by bolts along the side here to prevent any extra motion from the extra power when VTEC does kick in. So I'm going to remove those side reinforcement bolts first. They're 14 millimeter. Then I'm going to remove the two 14mm bolts that hold the main bearing caps on. I'm going to remove all these bolts here. So with those bolts free, I can then remove these main bearing caps. You can see this one's in pretty good condition. I'm going to remove this flex plate over here. This is a bit of a weird design. They've got these little tabs over this last main bearing here. 
so I can't really just pop it right out. I got to remove all the bolts for the rear main seal here. Now with the engine off the stand, it's much easier to access the 10 millimeter bolts for the rear main seal. And remove the rear main seal. And that bearing looks okay as well. And finally, after all that disassembly, I can remove the crankshaft from the block. This crankshaft's really oily, which is a good sign. So I'll just use my brother's old shirt again to wipe it down. So taking a look at this crankshaft layout for this V6 engine, you can see we've got the four main bearings over here. And in between that, we've got pairs of pistons. So we've got two paired off here, two in the middle, and then two on this side over here. Now, because this is a 60 degree V shape, it does help with balancing the engine side to side, as well as for secondary forces. However, compared to an inline six cylinder, because we have those pistons kind of paired off with each other, this is a more compact design. It does cause an imbalance in this direction here because your crankshaft's gonna wanna wobble. Essentially, if you've got an odd number of pair of pistons, it's gonna create moments rocking back and forth. There Therefore, your V6 engine is going to be more balanced than, say, a four cylinder, but not as smooth and as balanced as an inline six. Now, let's take a quick look at the oil lubrication system on this Honda engine to see how it's designed. And it's pretty straightforward. We've got this pickup tube that's going to bring in oil from the oil pan that sits here. That's going to feed the oil pump over here, which is going to create fluid flow. That oil flow is then going to flow over to this oil pressure switch and then connect over to the VTEC solenoid and oil filter housing over here. Now attached to the oil filter housing is the VTEC solenoid and that's just basically an on off solenoid that's going to direct fluid flow to complete a hydraulic circuit and activate VTEC. The oil is going to flow in through here and then back out through this port over here into this oil pump housing. That oil pump housing then has this passage over here that's going to lead up to this hole over here on the block. And not only is that oil going to feed the block, it's also going to feed a secondary circuit here for the VTEC actuation. Now if we correlate that with the block, we've got this main oil galley that runs down the middle of this V engine and then we've got the secondary circuit for the VTEC that goes inside of the block. Now that main oil galley that runs down the middle is going to operate these little piston sprayers to lubricate the piston walls and it's also going to feed these holes here to lubricate the main bearings as well as the connecting rod bearings attached on the crankshaft that sits in here. Now looking from above we have these two holes here that are going to feed off of that main oil galley to feed the head with lubricating oil. Now at the back of the block here we have these two little squirters that are going to feed oil to the VTEC on either side of the head here. You can see how they feed off of the VTEC oil galley down below. Now the bottom of the head you can see the oil feed goes through the bolt hole for the actual head bolt on this side and the VTEC oil feed goes through the bolt hole for this side. Now at the top of the head you can see we've got holes that were drilled here that go over to the head bolt hole and that head bolt hole is going to take that oil and bring that inside of here to actuate the VTEC. Over on this side here we have the same kind of thing where a hole was drilled to go and tap into the oil hole over here coming from this, this head bolt and then over inside of here to lubricate the camshaft. And over here we have the intake valves and on this side we have the exhaust valves where the spark plug tubes are located. We've got this set of rockers here that will ride off of these three cam profiles over here. So you can see the intake side is the one that has the VTEC because it's got three different rockers. On this side here we just have individual rockers for the exhaust side so there's no VTEC on this side. And I'm going to remove all these 12 millimeter bolts so we can have a look under the rockers. I like how Honda's labeled exhaust bolts and the in bolts right on the bolt head so you can't mix up the difference in length. And we can take a look. Taking a look at this rocker here, you can see this is the hole that's going to bring in that oil pressure through these feed holes on over here to activate the VTEC. Now taking a look at the camshaft, you can see we've got the exhaust side and the outsides here and the intake side over here and this one has multiple, that'll engage your VTEC. Now this is a single overhead cam which means that you have only one camshaft that's shared by both the intake and the exhaust side. Now the disadvantage to that is that on newer engines where you have variable valve timing, you can't vary the intake side separately from the exhaust side. Now on the rocker arms here, this here is where you would do your valve adjustment to bring this little piece a little bit closer so you don't get that tap 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 noise from your valve train. Now any oil that's done its job of lubricating or activating VTEC is then going to make its way down through gravity through these oil return ports at the bottom of the head. The oil is then going to use gravity to flow through the block over here down into the oil pan to be recirculated. Now most of the other pistons did show only minor wear on the bearings here. There's nothing like it spun a rod or anything. The piston tops did have some carbon buildup but overall this engine did look pretty mechanically healthy at least. Now while I don't see any major failure with this engine so far I can definitely tell it's lived a long mileage or a really hard life. Probably because it's inside of a Type S people really pound those cars good. You can see there's so much sludge buildup inside of here. So this definitely needed to be maintained a little bit better. So the next time you start up your old reliable Honda V6 engine, think of all the components that go into it that have been tested over the past two decades to make it work. Make sure you follow me on Instagram for more behind the scenes footage. Subscribe and hit the bell notification icon to see more videos just like this one. Check out my new glass top coffee engine table I made out of the Type S engine.
It's even got a working flywheel clock on the back.